And I'm Michael Manfredi. We're both design partners at Weiss Manfredi. And we began our firm, Weiss Manfredi, which we now are Weiss Manfredi Architecture, Landscape and Urbanism, with the idea that uh, too many things, when they're bounded in just one word, like architecture, can't capture all the challenges that we were especially interested in engaging, whether it was all about the landscape, all about the city, all about infrastructure, or all about the precision of what architecture can bring. So we began our practice by entering competitions that asked larger questions. And we were lucky enough to win uh, the Women's Memorial Competition and form our practice in 1991. <laughs> One of the interesting things we found is that at that time we were one of the few architectural firms that also did landscape. We were very interested in furniture design, so we were very interested in multiple scales. And it was our sort of deep conviction that architectural projects and architectural problems needed to have a much broader multidisciplinary approach rather than just thinking about architecture or landscape or furniture design. So we really established an office and a studio with the idea that we would gather the best young architects, the best young designers that really, like us, felt that this was a very important crusade. I think what's been exciting for us is that we began just with the two of us and a few of our students. And both of us have been teaching ever since we began our practice. Uh, I'm currently the Graham Chair Professor of Architecture at University of Pennsylvania, Michael's at Harvard. And what we have found is that the coincidence of being able to do deep research in the academic studios and project by project deep research here has allowed us to actually think of dreams that are transcending the kind of boundaries of what we might have been asked to do in a more conventional architectural practice. Uh, we've been especially engaged by the ideas of topography because topography for us, I'm from the hills of California, Michael's from the hills of Rome. Um, topography for us is a way a city begins to differentiate different terraces and levels that are highly public in some areas and then highly intimate and sort of unfolding and hidden. And this idea of being able to leverage topography has created opportunities that are like no other. So weaving and knitting together all these agendas have, has for us been a way of realizing these dreams that we've been exploring both in academia and in practice. So in the studio now we have uh, about 40 uh, designers, architects, landscape architects. Um, we also have students here, so we really try to um, establish a studio that is um, in some ways like an academic studio. It asks questions even though the projects are very complex and they're very, very real and rooted in very real problems. We use projects, as Marion said, to in a way dream a little bit, to do research, and to think about how the art of architecture can have a very meaningful engagement with society. You could say that the same thing that we share with every project is a, a universal sense of terror, you know, that we begin knowing that we actually know nothing. Uh, and we like to dive in and do as much research as possible and postpone conclusions for as long as possible. And that delay allows us to kind of 
literally build and construct the site as it is, to do research about the legacy behind it, understand more about the program, and maybe discover that the wrong questions have been asked. So often, we actually don't like to jump in. We like to kind of dance around the edges and circle as long as possible. And finally, that delay leads to a level of distilled clarity and that distilled clarity is where we discovered that we transcend the kind of boundaries of what's architecture, what's landscape, what's urban design, what's infrastructure. We love competitions because they allow us to really reach well beyond uh, maybe what the brief even suggests and asks for, and that really allows you to give measure to a large piece of imagination. But we also love clients who have dreams that they can't quite put their finger on, but they know they want us to explore with them the best possible way to give measure mm. to that imagination. And yeah. at the end of the day, you just really want to be working with people whose aspirations and dreams are beyond who they are, but actually want to go much further to create something, hopefully, that has a, a larger, more during impact. I think we always want to start with, whether it's a competition or a client, what is their dream? Is it a big dream or is it just a dream about making some money or doing quickly a uh, design? If a competition is asking interesting questions that are more than just, well, it's 10,000 square meters, uh, you know, 5,000 square meters of factory, 5,000 square meters, that doesn't interest us. But if somebody says, well, how do we integrate living and working and that's the question of the competition. Fantastic, we jump in, work like crazy. Um, it's been said that a city is a big house and a house is a small city. And that's a very interesting observation because you have to bring also the same level of passion to a very small project that you bring to a very large project. We sometimes think that really good architecture is like acupuncture. With one very precise move, you can help your whole body. And for us, we think of architecture, good architecture, as being like acupuncture. With great simplicity and great focus, many good things can happen. I think by us being in one big studio, it means that we're a part of every project. We're not in a special office away from everybody. We get emotional and intellectual stimulation from every team. And I think hopefully every team feels that we are part of that, that pushing that project forward. So it's very important philosophically for us to be like everybody else. We don't have the big office, we don't have huge desks, we have the same desk everybody has. We're really part of making projects and for us that's a very important philosophical and ethical question. We of course lead the design, we lead the office, but it's not like we're some kind of the queen and the king up there with everybody down below. We really we really look for designers and architects who bring a great deal of, of their own passion to architecture. Because making architecture is very, very, um, making any kind of art requires a great deal of work and passion. And so the passion we get from them comes to us and the passion we give to them, we hope makes the work much more interesting. You know, we like to think that we have an enduring innocence about what style means and, and what style reveals itself in each project. Uh, you could say that everything is a new beginning and we used to feel that because everything was a new beginning our work uh, didn't have any sibling relationship with each other. Over time people have found that 
the three things that seem to be very powerful in each one of our projects is an idea of constructing a site first and postponing the expression of architecture, having a very clear diagram that is very simple and strong, um, recognizing that silhouette against the sky is the signature of what allows us to remember something. And so mm. all of our projects share some of those uh, components, but in entirely different ways. And light yeah. and movement uh, yeah. and the kind of idea of transparency is a kind of underpinning that seems to emerge. Maybe the way to describe it uh, that I think um, Marion's touched on is all our projects have uh, similar concerns. There's a concern for light, the concern of movement, the concern of topography, the concern of a, public a very a strong public dimension, and the sense of, of a, a project being completely integrated with its site. But the language is different. If we're in India, we have to think about the language of hot sun, heavy rains. If we're in New York, we have to think about the language of this very particular light in New York that comes off the water and the density of New York. If we're in Milano, we have to think about the weather of Milano. But the same concerns are important to us in Milano or India. We're all human beings. And in that sense, buildings can't be so different that they ignore some of the more fundamental things that, that you and I and all of us share. I think we look for simplicity because you can always make something more complex, but once a project's too complex, you can't make it simpler. And this is true, I think, in literature. It's true in painting. It's true in film. I, I think for us also, we both draw, and we've drawn a lot with charcoal. We both loved figure drawing, and the amazing thing about our digital sort of landscape that we can work in that's very, very precise and elastic mm -hmm. in its own way is complicated by, if you will, the joys of the physical language of drawing. And what those two worlds do when they're together allow a kind of indefinite imprecision that finally leads to something that we engage with our engineers to make very, very precise. And that's really the joy because we don't quite know where we're going, but we know we want to be there. And I think that not knowing is part of what makes it fun every time. Well, we're in our uh, model shop that is right next to the studio. We actually make models here and also off-site, but what we love is just uh, several 3D printers that allow us to study very complex shapes. And for us, models are study tools. They're not finished products. They are part of the design process. So the 3D printers sometimes are at different scales, so we can actually look inside a series of surfaces. This is a lobby, and we can think about the material and the geometric qualities. Sometimes we work with um, laser cutters. Sometimes uh, it's for a very simple model that is a study model of topography. So it's all about a series of flat sheets that are cut. Sometimes those sheets are more precise. They're made of plastic so we can code areas of landscape, areas of water and vegetation. So models become very important in how we work. Uh, we're less interested in models as a finished part of our process, really interested in models as the process. On this project for MIT, Brian, I think we're really, I think we really need to try to capture how the project changes, whether it's frontal or whether it's oblique in the sense of it being very transparent or very opaque. And where are we with the glass in terms of capturing that? Well, we've uh, gradiented the pattern of the gl uh, etched glass. Mm. It's more dense towards the center fold of the tower. And we've also uh, changed the depth of the, the metal fins to accentuate the, the 
uh, folding on the tabs. Oh, I see. So this would be denser and a little deeper, and yeah. then as we move out, yeah. um, have you looked at the shape of the fins yet? That yeah, we've been developing some fin shapes with the contractor and uh, adjusting the finish quality of it to get more light to reflect off of it. Because I think if we get a slightly curved shape, maybe it'll be really a little more uh, mysterious. Well, let's look at the material quality because I think this mysterious sense of the glass being opaque and more transparent will be really driven by the material. Is this the glass we're looking at, Brian? Uh, yes, these are the, the etched panels. Uh, mm. We're working with the contractor to look at different levels of opacity for this. So uh, when it uh, has a, the back pan behind it, the amount of uh, frit that is on this uh, back surface will uh, affect the color greatly. So that's one of the things we'll look at in the mock-up. Yeah, and I like the way the light sometimes it goes very dark and a little bit lighter, and we should really maybe try to push that. What's what's yeah, the exactly. relationship of the fin? I'm trying to get these two to match as they as they do trans. Ah, so this will curve around, yeah, and then really pick up. So on the oblique, then it looks very solid, and then frontally a little more transparent. Um, I think we should really push this curve because the curve is going to give it a little bit of lightness. Okay. Good. For the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, uh, we did a visitor center where, as we dug in and learned about the site that they'd identified for the visitor center, we said, it's all wrong. It's in the middle of the garden. And if we just pulled it 500 feet away to the edge of the city and then allowed it to unfold as an inhabitable topography and then slide its way in as if it's 100% garden, that would be a better way to make a visitor center for a garden. What I wanted to do was show you at the Hunter's Point Pavilion is that we had been thinking about those four buildings that they wanted us to do. And one was small, the other was medium, the next one was large, and then the rest was just a covered area for a, you know, a ferry stop. And so we just said, well, what if we could kind of fan out and have the little buildings, the maintenance buildings, be little. And then finally actually have the port for the ferry be the thing that reaches out. So this much is building and this much is cover. So this kind of play is also part of that research. So this was the result of many, many studies, some that are in the garbage. But what we discovered, and this is actually a very interesting point, is by doing more with less, we can create something truly a beauty. The folds allowed us to catch water. So the roof catches water and irrigates the plants. It also, on the south side, holds solar canopies so that Those the sun solar panels on the south. light the park. And then, of course, it's a beautiful shape that is rigid, right? Because by folding paper, the structural properties become stronger. So we always are looking for something that can do many, many things with just one beautiful move. And then of course, by turning it and curving it, it becomes more By sensuous. turning and curving it, it managed to face the, the uh, Empire State Building. So, so and we'll show you uh, we'll, we'll detailed show models.
think this kind of exciting moment is if we've just, we've just finished the construction drawings, we're just sliding into the kind of furniture, fixture, finishes, etc. But I think as we think about this kind of exquisite glass, you know, radius oval that we have at the center at Becton and innovative thinking is effectively supposed to be brought together in the center, it's far better to think about it as really an extension of the landscape, you know, that it's really coming out of the conversations in the garden. And I think you all, thanks for assembling all this right now, because I, partly it's really understanding how it relates to the, I'm looking over there, both to the landscape that's, that's going to be planted around that courtyard, but how does it make its way in? What we put together is, uh, based on the, the plantings that we've picked at the moment, we basically have more of a spring and a fall palette that we wanted to bring into the building. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see there's, uh, this is one uh, series of fabrics and paints and tiles that we've looked at, and, and this is another. And, and Catherine has basically done some research, and Heather as well, on the carpet and on the tile. context of the embassy in India, how we can accommodate this incredible complexity within a tradition of India. Have we been thinking about the types of trees yet and the kind I mean, of... We've sort of been creating this promenade of, of palm here. trees along the central corridor that kind of sets off this dialogue between mm. the historic building and our, and our new design and also bringing the garden spaces into the offices by creating you know, these sort of sunken areas to allow the garden to, you know, sort of enter the workplace for, for the people who are there. The other thing I want to make sure we do, guys, is as we think about the outside, we also think about the same kind of stone, Indian stone, that would come inside. And I think that's going to be really important to establish a relationship of cool shaded areas that go in and out and out and in. Roosevelt Island here in you know the East River there's this strip of land and with Mayor Bloomberg creating an idea that technology is going to be a part of the growth of New York City's intelligence and and you know sort of leadership Cornell Tech won this competition to build this Center for Innovation and Campus on Roosevelt Island. And we won the competition for the building that in many ways embodied the dream, which is to bring technology and entrepreneurs and academics together. So we were given a funny box of a, of a diagram and they said, fill in the box with part businesses and part research laboratories and some public space. And our first reaction is, are you kidding? We're on Roosevelt Island. We have water on two sides. We have the idea of being able to be elevated to see the view of the city. So why don't we just pull that box in half and create river-to-river -river views so that you could really see across that landscape and make it very much a kind of ship out on the water. So that pulling it apart created all the kind of dialogue spaces that they wanted to have happen between the entrepreneurs and the research folks. And it was this idea of the site driving a new answer to the question that they thought was really just fill the box up with the program space. Because they wanted a nice box with nice architecture around it. And we thought we would never win the competition because we broke all the rules. We said, we're not going to do one box, we'll do two prisms. 
But someone in that group, um, three people who were very visionary, they said, why are we doing a box if we can do something much more interesting that is actually very social, very environmental because it recognizes views. And very sectional and also, so that you could actually look out it, to the city. It looks very sexy too. <laughs> but that, you know, these, and then that's when it's a lot of fun to get an incredible consultant team together and talk to our engineers yeah. about having a completely column free space that feels suspended above that landscape so everybody on the campus has open views oh. to the water. So that meant lifting most of the building up which also responded to the ideas of resilience. Floods. The flood the flood situation of all the waterfront cities around the world are considerations that we need to embed into our initial thinking. And so the amphitheater of earthwork and tiered landscapes that frame the plinth for that building already provides protection. But then the elevated part, which is all surrounded by a truss, gives some column-free collaboration space. Toronto's goal, which is so interesting, is the idea of innovation, research, entrepreneurs coming together in a place that's highly visible becomes super interesting because if we're looking at these kinds of laboratory research spaces everywhere else, what we're also trying to achieve, though, is this kind of place of full collaboration at these centers. And if these, in fact, are going to be winter gardens with true landscape, do we have clear enough glass that's going to be letting in the kind of solar registration to keep the trees and plants alive? Because I'm still curious about our both our performance requirements and then the kind of solar gain in a way that you want for things to grow. one we face south, we're lucky on this one we face west, reasonable over here facing north, Correct. it should be, right, it should be fine, put it right on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, makes sense, yeah, okay.